So this is lesson three in introduction to salmon habitat restoration. So just as a quick review, if you recall, in lesson one, we talked about a single species of salmon, Chinook salmon. But we also pointed out there's a lot of life history variability in this species, almost to the point where certain populations do things so much differently than other populations, you could almost argue they were just about different species. So to capture that variation, we put them in a group called the Tai team. In this lesson two, we talked about three species of salmon, pink salmon, sockeye salmon, and chum salmon. Now, for chum and sockeye, only certain forms of these species that act in somewhat similar ways to pink salmon. And that team was called the clean stream team. To, to, to denote that these fish primarily spawn in the flowing waters, the bigger channels, the bigger side channels of rivers. So lesson three. This is a group of three species that focused and primarily use groundwater type habitats. So again, sockeye salmon, chum salmon, and a new species, coho salmon. Again, for the Again, for the, uh, these three species, these are only certain forms. There's other forms of these three species that use habitat differently. So for this group, we've designated it the Waters from the Earth team. I hope you find it interesting, uh, makes you think, makes you ask questions. So let's get started. Lesson three has been broken up into four modules. The first module will define why these certain species and forms are put into a grouping we call the waters from the earth team. Now these species of salmon are dependent on upwelling groundwater for their spawning sites. And there is an introduction to what a constructed groundwater fed spawning channel is and does and how it is used by this group of salmon. Module two is a detailed discussion on the construction of a groundwater fed channel and how these habitats are used by these three species of salmon. We use Mamquam Channel loca located on the Mamquam River. It's a major tributary of the Squamish River as an example of this technique. Module three, we briefly discuss an alternate form of upwelling spawning habitat using example the example of the Hicks Creek spawning ponds in the lower Fraser Valley. And finally, in module four, we discuss using a number of examples of how groundwater spawning habitat can be used to support sockeye salmon populations at risk. Now, highlighted projects include those already constructed on the Calum and Adams River in BC North and the interior regions. We also discuss how groundwater spawning habitat restoration techniques might be applied to other sockeye salmon populations at risk here in Skarshtabuk, using examples of the Widgeon Slough and Cultus Lake sockeye populations. And finally, this module closes with a story that captures how these unique groundwater habitats support late spawning salmon in streams all around the Pacific Rim. I hope you enjoy lesson three. Okay, so this water from the earth team includes these different types of sockeye salmon. And there's a theme here, spawning much later in the year. This is a theme common to all the members of this team. So for sockeye, perhaps mid-November, as late as January, 
a type of chum salmon that also spawns roughly this time, mid-November to January. And a new entry for the team species we haven't talked about yet, coho salmon, that just spawns really late in the year, December through March. So that sort of defines how the types of forms that fall into this, this group of species. Now, aside from spawning late in the year, uh, we have to think about, we've been told previously that the average water temperature they spawn in uh, defines when they spawn because they're all effectively trying to get out of the gravel roughly the same time, April 1st, which means they must be spawning in water that is very, very warm. And they're spawning in midwinter, mid the coldest months of the year. So how does that work? Warm water during the coldest months of the year. So this is what ties these three forms together, these three, three species. They have adapted to seek out warm, clean water upwelling from deep underground. We often call it groundwater or even springs. And over the past century, many cultures viewed springs as sacred because and magical because they flowed all the time, they were always clean, they never froze, those sorts of things. They were, people understood they were different. These forms of salmon know they're different and seek them out. So they're heated. Why they're warmer? Because they've been underground and they take the heat of the earth, the summer heat and the heat of the earth in these aquifers where they're stored through the year and they're, they're slowly released in these upwelling areas what we call the springs or groundwater upwelling areas and they don't freeze even on the coldest day. I uh, remember a project we did, a groundwater project up on the ski net place called Kitwanga which is quite far in the interior, the tributary of the mid Skeena and a groundwater little habitat was created in this case for coho salmon and some relatively rare upriver chum salmon Coming there in January, and it might have been minus 30, a really cold day, coming around the corner, and you saw these drifting, uh, fog-like, uh, wild uh, environment above this little channel. The, the water was so warm, it was interacting with the cold air and creating this other world of uh, mists and fog. It refused to freeze. It was really a sacred place. So that's the idea. So we're going to be talking about these types of places, um, and these interesting bunch of types of sockeye chum and cove that seek them out. And we've developed techniques uh, to make more of these special places because they are highly productive for salmon, both for spawning and in case of coho for rearing. Okay, so you might want to do a little reading on this. They're called Groundwater Channels. It's chapter 7 dash page 11 in our old friend, the Salmon Habitat Restoration Toolbox put together by Mr. Slaney. Have a click, have a read, and we'll carry this conversation forward. So as we discussed, this, these forms of soccer that we're talking about in the water from the earth team spawn typically much later in the year and they're seeking out these warm groundwater sites. So one example of these types of fish, relatively rare, are very small populations that you often find in these braided, uh, braided glacial uh, rivers that have wide floodplains, deep gravel deposits, but they do generate near surface aquifer in those deep deposits and often in the back sloughs when the river is lower there's seepages of groundwater that these sockeye salmon find so an example would in our area would be on the squamish watershed in rivers like the ashloo and mamquam river where sockeye spawn every every year in some of these groundwater upwelling sloughs or back sloughs of these rivers now, they are not just warmer 
uh, in terms of incubating eggs. That's what makes the populations later spawners. The eggs can ex grow at an accelerated rate and emerge roughly that April 1st time, by sp even though they spawn perhaps in November or even into December. But not only that, when the juveniles, the fry, emerge from the gravel, in these glacial watersheds, they're, they're a type of sockeye that does not go to a lake. They do their rearing in fresh water, but in the rivers, the back sloughs, and the marshes. And they, in fact, go to the ocean in their first summer. So it's very important when they emerge in early spring, some of these back channels, the rivers are low in these glacial watersheds, typically are low in the spring. They're in these warmer groundwater areas, which again are richer feeding areas earlier in the year. So the groundwater serves two purposes. One, it accelerates uh, incubation, but it also is a very stable form of water flow. So it gets pretty high survivals of those eggs and those fry come into a very warm, rich environment in the spring. Now these types of sockeye are called riverine sockeye. They're quite rare. They're rare and never abundant in most rivers, but the, you find them throughout the range of sockeye, particularly on the coast and particularly in these glacial streams. So they don't rear in a lake as we've talked about before for a year or two, they go to the ocean in their first. Um, so what we have found when man-made groundwater fed groundwater channels have been created, these fish show up on rivers like the example was the Mamcram River. So never abundant, but always present. These are the red jewels of the water from the earth team. Riverine sockeye, very special fish, groundwater dependent in many watersheds. Okay, what is this man-made groundwater fed channel constructed on the Mamcram River? I mentioned in the previous slide about riverine sockeye. Well, here it is. This is what these things look like. They can be a few hundred meters long. They're typically five or six meters wide. Some of them have large angular rock on the banks that provide a couple functions. One, it keeps the spawning fish from digging out the banks, which are made of finer materials and can degrade the quality of the spawning gravel and the spawning grounds. And also the large angular rock gives somewhere for wintering coho juveniles to hide. And a lot of them do in that angular rock. So this is the Manquam channel. Uh, we like to name the channels so we can find them and we can track them because it's important when you're assessing things to name things so they can put on, on various spreadsheets and people don't forget them. Often habitat features could be done and if you don't keep good records in 10 or 15 years, they naturalize and people would not know the work was ever done. And actually we lose opportunities to learn when we don't go back in 10 and 15 years and find out what's happening, okay? Now, if you look really closely, this is full of chum salmon. This is a typical chum salmon run on the Mamquam channel in the Mamquam River, which flows into the Squamish River just upstream from the town of Squamish. Full of chum salmon, November to December very high densities. This is prime habitat for groundwater fed forms of chum salmon. And why? The nearby Mamquam River goes up and down all winter long. When we get the big floods, it could be really turbid, really a lot of sediment moving, gravel movement. But you can come to the Mamquam Channel, which is only a few hundred meters separated from the Mamquam River itself, just off on the floodplain. It connects at its lower end to the river but it's set back on the floodplain and it will look the same 365 days a year. The water's clear, no matter how hard the rain is falling and how high, high the river is. And this is what these species, these groundwater focused species are cluing into. They find these habitats. We don't put them in there. You create the habitat and the fish move in and do what they do. They lay their eggs in the gravel, simple. So I want to hit off one of the questions that might come in this uh, as part of this discussion later. Now I talked about the coho salmon beginning their spawning just at the back end of chum salmon. And if you recall, we talked about all the fry of these species sort of trying to get out of the gravel by April 1st and it's related to the water temperature. So the 
logic would be, why wouldn't the coho come at the same time as the chum and the sockeye, which take about a thousand accumulated thermal units, ATUs, thermal units, to get out of the ground. Well, it turns out that coho salmon break the rules. They only take about 750 accumulated thermal units. So they developed 25% uh, quicker than these other species. Therefore, they can be slightly behind the main spawn of the other species and avoid all the turmoil and traffic of all these big fish trying to spawn. They slip in behind, but their juveniles are still trying to get out by April 1st. However, as I said, there are some very late coho, and they may be doing some certain things trying to give their juveniles a higher chance of survival. And I will be talking a little bit more about what those uh, factors might be at the end of the next discussion about Hicks Creek coho. So I've put a link to a visual story uh, done by our salmon friend, Bob Turner, of the Howe Sound at Ketsam uh, and Squamish River watershed. It's about uh, chum salmon spawning in groundwater fed habitat in that beautiful place in northern at Ketsam. You should watch it. So that last example of the Mamquam Channel. So how do you build these things called groundwater channels. I'm going to take a step back. This technique was developed in the uh, very beginning of um, the Sam Enhancement Program, or just before it actually, in the mid-1970s. It's a, a technique that was developed here in southern BC by a couple of gentlemen named Ray Finnegan and Dave Marshall. Both ultimately worked for the Sam Enhancement Program of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, so there was a lot of these uh, channels constructed through the 80s and 90s and even in more recent years. So how do you build them? Well, there's a, they are sort of complicated in you have to do some measurements. You have to monitor groundwater levels on these floodplains. See how far the gravel goes below the surface. All sorts of measurements. So at the end of the day, though, if a site is identified that has all the criteria for creating a groundwater channel, it's really not much more than just digging a big ditch beside the river and heading upstream and away from the river if you can because of the floods. And uh, you dig a deep hole and water flows into it if you've done all your preliminary assessments correct. Now, digging groundwater channels isn't done everywhere. There's actually relatively few sites in our area, southern BC, for groundwater channels. And typically, the way you get a hint if there is an ability to dig these types of habitats, to build these types of habitats, you look for late spawning chum salmon as an indicator of good near surface aquifers that have groundwater. So effectively, the fish lead you to the best sites for this type of technique. Interesting. So when you go to the literature, you can find chum salmon that are spawning November, December, quite late. And you look at the amount of chum salmon area, it gives you a hint of the strength and the um, uh, area and, and areas that the actual near surface aquifers are available to try this technique. So it's quite interesting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to build it um, in the next discussion. So just looking off to the right, you'll see a conceptual sketch of a groundwater channel on this Dead Man Channel on Dead Man Creek. So you look at the bottom of the slide and you can see a channel has been dug leaving the river but moving away from the stream on the floodplain. And what you can't see is it's being dug at a relatively flat level. So if you think of the stream, the river, as you go upstream, the river is typically rising. There's a slope on the stream, whereas the groundwater channel is a very low slope. So every 100 meters you go up, you go a little deeper in the ground. And at some point, you intercept the valley groundwater table. 
And as you move even farther, you start drawing that water table into the channel and it flows away through the newly constructed channel. That water flowing into the channel upwells through the, the gravels at the base of the channel. And that's the definition of an upwelling groundwater spawning area. And it's exactly those types of areas that uh, these forms of salmon target. So effectively, a big ditch, relatively flat, paralleling the river, far enough away that the floods won't fill it in when you do get a big flood. And if you see that little sketch in the middle, roughly at the top, you want to be 1.5 meters between the, below the standing water table. So the water table that you measured during your assessment phase, when you dug little test pits and put some pipes down and monitored it over the year, You'd say, okay, here's the water table. We want the bottom of the channel to draw the water down roughly 1.5 meters. By drawing it down, it generates flow, and basically you get a flowing channel as a result. Groundwater channel, simple. Okay, so let's go through some visual images during the construction, the actual construction of one of these groundwater channels. So the first, first step, effectively, is to go into the floodplain and clear yourself a right away where the channel is going to be. Now, often the site of the channel can follow old remnant flood channels of the river well back from the river presently. In the developed areas of the south, often these areas are in fact protected by riverside dikes. The rivers have been channelized by bank armoring to predict various structures. So often these old remnant channels can be used as the site for these groundwater channels. They're dry now, but once we get finished, they would be flowing. So you can see the finer sediments are being removed and the trees are being removed, but just below those finer sediments, you can see the river gravels from the old uh, river bed, and that is where the aquifer is. Now, if you look off to the right, there's a little ditch being dug, and that ditch will be dug down to the final grade of the channel. It's a narrow ditch. What it does is it actually drains the water table down, so most of the material that you remove from the main channel is now dried out. It's easier to handle, it's cleaner to, cleaner to handle, but you can also use the ditch, the early ditch, to get a sense what is the strength of the aquifer as you're building the channel. In case you have to adjust and change maybe the grade of your channel to go a little deeper into the water table if you feel you aren't getting the flows you expected from your preliminary assessments. Again, it's not absolute, uh, we do not have absolute certainty what exactly we're going to hit in a complex floodplain before we dig. We, we have test pits, but we don't know across the whole length of the channel. So we have to adjust as we go. So this picture is a little farther along in the construction. You can see the large excavator has moved upstream. And the little ditch on the left is following that water table and is close to the final grade of the river. And you can see it's drawn the water table probably down two meters or a, a certain distance. And the gravels from the channel bed are dry and will be removed. So as we go upstream, this ditch will get deeper and deeper into the floodplain. So again, another view, again, we're moving farther upstream. And as we discussed, the channel being relatively flat and the floodplain at a slope like the river, there's a gradient on the floodplain. We get deeper and deeper as we go upstream. We're following the water table and it means we have to handle a lot more material. Now this material is being loaded in a truck 
and is, is being hauled away, and it provides a little berm that wiggles through the trees between the river and the new channel. So in a big flood, the river comes up against the berm and backwaters the channel from below because it's connected to the river, but effectively it keeps the finer silts and muds and sands on one side of the berm, the riverside, and on the land side, the clear water, the groundwater remains. And that really keeps the gravels in these spawning areas clean and pristine and not uh, continuously having fine sediments deposited on them. So this is just that set, setback dike or berm that I described the previous slide showing the truck being loaded. It finds its way through the floodplain. We typically try to meander through the trees and the intent is simply to separate the dirty water from the flooding river from the clear water in the groundwater channel so we don't get those fine sediments. But we do not want to train the river so we set well back from the river in the floodplain forest. It's a soft berm. It's not meant to stop the river. If the river erodes that forest away, it typically will erode these berms away and at some point potentially occupy where the groundwater channel is. However, that's partly about the design and siting of these sites. We try to put them in parts of the floodplain that likely will not be challenged by the river for decades possibly even longer. That's part of the design and the site, this, this, uh, the site considerations. So this is the finished groundwater channel. It's the Brennan Park channel on the Mamquam River, which is just across the river from the previous channel, the Mamquam channel. It is in the same aquifer, but on the opposite side of the river, set well back from the from the active channel of the Manquam River. So you can see the groundwater channel. A couple things. The channel just ends, it just stops. All the flow is generated from the bed of the gravel. Nothing comes in at the top from any sort of pipe or structure, which makes these channels somewhat unique. Uh, you'll notice the banks have been armored with coarse rock, again to provide cover for coho juveniles that like to hide in the rock during the day during the winter winter time to keep away from predators and come out during the evenings and nighttime to feed. Off to the right is that flood protection berm of the materials that came out of the groundwater channel provides that protective berm that keeps the dirty, silty water and the big floods in the Mamquam River from dumping over and depositing in the clean spawning gravels of the channel. So once it's built, no fish has probably been in this part of the floodplain for decades, possibly centuries. It's very normal to have many chum salmon, many coho salmon, the odd sockeye salmon show up in the very first year. And over the years, those numbers increase because it doesn't rely on fish finding the channel alone. It also has fish that have spawned in the channel and want to return to their home grounds. So over time, these channels get very, very busy, a lot of competition for space, and when you get the big chum salmon years, particularly the good marine survival years in the ocean, it is quite an impressive sight. So this is this earthwarmed, upwelling, well oxygenated water, nurtures these developing eggs all winter through all the floods and the cold spells, just as stable as can be. That's the magic of groundwater channels. So a little closer look of the finished channel, a couple things. The little red line, you can see there's a, there's a layer of fine sediment. That's the silts and sands that's deposited on the floodplain when we get the big floods in the Manquam River. That's what I was talking about, the protective berm that denies that fine sediments depositing in the channel. So this is just after construction. Well, you can see the gravel on the base of the channel. You can see it's covered with a light layer of silt, silty silts that have been kicked up during construction. So what do we need? We need some spawning fish to make that gravel the best it can be. So all you have to do is add spawning fish and it looks quite different. So this is a picture of a groundwater channel two months after construction. Uh, you'll notice the gravel bed is now clean as a whistle. So typically the first fish arrived, often they are chum salmon. 
And just the fish fighting, uh, protecting red sites, and beginning to dig, just that activity, 24 hours a day, moves most of the finer silts and sands off of the top of the gravel, cleans up the channel. The actual digging cleans the gravel at a deeper level. So uh, chum salmon again often arrive in these groundwater areas in November, perhaps as even as early as Halloween. And these are those beautiful green and purple salmon. So intermixed in those in that species is a very, very few, in the Mamquam channel particularly, a very, very few of these red uh, colored riverine sockeye. And we'll show us a picture of them. And often you don't notice them, but they are there. And if you do see them, you should count yourself lucky because often they're uh, viewed to be coho salmon, but they're not. They're actually a separate species of salmon that is using these groundwater areas for spawning and probably early rearing because they don't rear in lakes, unlike most sockeye salmon. They rear in sloughs, groundwater side channels for a number of weeks or months before they actually enter the ocean in their very first year. Now the last wave of salmon into the groundwater channels typically are the coho salmon. And these, these fish can show up again relatively early, perhaps as early as November, but the runs definitely strengthen beginning in December. And then in the Mamquam River example, in the Squamish watershed, it's very common to have a wave of coho starting in Jan, you know, beginning in January, the first week of January, every 10 days or so, another small wave of coho will come. And you'll even get coho rolling into those groundwater channels as late as March. Now, why is this important? These late fish, they're, they're really critical food sources for uh, species like eagles. These are really the last opportunity to eat salmon as in the in the depths of winter so often the eagles that you'll see along these groundwater channels particularly in the squamish but also in the shehalish river flats on the harrison river or on the lower vetter or norris creek in the fraser valley these eagles that accumulate and sometimes you may see 20 eagles sitting in a single tree they're from all over southern bc perhaps even northern washington they've migrated uh, to this area because these are, these are the very last salmon available uh, to them, particularly in these tough days of winter, before the herring spawn begins in the early days of spring. So a couple of references if you're interested in uh, how groundwater channels are built, how much they cost, and the fry production. There's a very good summary report done by Greg Bennell of a, a series of groundwater channels built in BC in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> and here's the link to it. And the last reference is a unique uh, film that we converted to a video done in 1988 that shows the uh, start and middle and end of building a physical groundwater channel on the Indian River, which is near Vancouver at the top of Burrard Inlet, and it's called Jack Slough. It's well worth uh, looking at. It's a unique uh, record of history and how these things are built. So one more Water from the Earth project that you might find interesting, I certainly do. It's located on Hicks Creek, that small mountain-fed tributary of the Mariah Slough we referred to in Lesson 1. But this story is about a very special run of coho salmon. Now, Hicks Creek has some of the latest timed spawning coho in the whole Fraser River watershed. So wave after wave of coho come into these spawning grounds starting just after Christmas. There'll be some on New Year's Day, some on Valentine's Day, and even Perhaps on April Fool's Day, it is not unheard of to see a coho spawning in Hicks Creek. But not just anywhere in the creek. In two clear, magical pools of water that bubble out of the earth, coming from under a broken rock slide that has fallen from high up in the hills to down beside the creek. This is warm, magical groundwater. So when these two spawning areas, these two groundwater discharge pools were identified, 
the observation was made that the amount of flow, flow was very high. It wasn't a typical slow upwelling in a gravel bed as described in the previous groundwater channels. It was more water coming through these broken rock talus type uh, deposits and discharging in large springs. And there was upwelling, but it was a relatively small area, but a very high flow. So the idea was, could we take the flows that are coming out of this talus slope some of the flow was in areas the fish couldn't use. It was in broken rock. Could it, Was there a way to collect it and then put it into another upwelling pond, specially designed, but have that water very efficiently upwell so you could increase the amount of spawning area? So a pilot project was done to create a large pond with a uh, that had a system where galleries were sent out at the base of the slide, collected the water through a perforated pipe gallery, put it into a, a solid pipe along one side of the pond, and then off that solid pipe came all these little feeder pipes, and all those pipes were buried under approximately half a meter, 18 inches of spawning gravel. So looking at the picture, the galleries are both left and right of the pond, the large solid pipe is just exposed. It's that bright green pipe you can see. And you can see the little white pipes coming off it. Each of those have little perforations in it. Now, typically they would be under the gravel, as I said, about a half a meter, and that water would upwell slowly across the whole pond. Now, interestingly, the only reason we can see this is this pond's had somewhere between 25, 20 and 25 years of spawning and even though there's no, there's no current in this pond, that gravel has been slowly moved away from this end of the pond toward the other end of the pond and actually pushed out the outlet of the pond just by the way the fish oriented. So it shows you the bones of the pond and obviously the pond has been identified. It's time to reset those pipes and replace that gravel because the spawning has been so heavy that gravel in fact has moved. So it's partly a result of its success. So the first pond was built in 1986, worked very well, and the second pool of upwelling water was uh, reconstructed in 1993. They continue to be very productive today, both for coho salmon and actually a small population of chum salmon also use these ponds on Hicks Creek. Okay, I'm going to head off one of the questions for those people that were actually listening to some of the biology I discussed earlier. And the questions would revolve around if all the salmon fry are trying to get out, get out by April 1st, why would coho be spawning close to April 1st? It does not make sense from that part of this presentation. So quickly, this is, and I don't know the answer, but this is what I think. Hicks Creek itself comes out of a very steep watershed, broken rock, a lot of talus, highly unstable. Spawning in the main stem is very, very limited. Two areas of high quality spawning, groundwater upwelling areas, but they're very limited in size. So you have a relatively small spawning ground, but also potentially a very large rearing habitat in Upper Mariah Slough just downstream. So now you're a coho salmon. The old rule of thumb, the first one in the habitat in the spring, the fry, they often define territories and uh, stake out the ground. But when you're in a slough environment or a lake environment, it's sort of hard to stake out a lake or a big deep slough. So you can come late to the party and still find habitat. You just join the school of fish that's swimming around. So that's something to think about. So you're a coho salmon, you come into Hicks Creek, you want your eggs to survive. You come in early, you spawn in the groundwater pond, you spawn in the creek. Two things happen. If you spawn in the creek, you probably have five or six gravel moving floods to get through the winter. Your eggs 
likely aren't going to survive very well. But you spawned in that nice clean pond. But guess what? There's four more waves of coho coming behind you every couple weeks. And your poor little egg is that nice shiny clean patch of gravel. The next bunch are going to dig it up. So what does it do? It probably forces the spawners to later and later spawning, trying to get their eggs to survive either the waves of floods in Hick Creek or the waves of spawners in these tiny little ponds that you might have a thousand coho trying to get into in a really good year. Anyway, that's the only thing I have come up with why Hicks Creek coho break all the rules uh, and come very, very late. It's probably pressure from these two sources, but maybe someone will do a scientific paper and figure it out. Let's hope. So we started out this story talking a lot about conservation units when we began with um, our Tai team, Chinook salmon. And the reason is Chinook salmon often, uh, an individual population, a single population can in fact be a, a conservation unit. The Mariah Slough Chinook are an example of that. Um, and that's quite common. They're, they're quite unique, each population. Now there's also uh, conservation units have multiple po populations, uh, particularly in interior BC, uh, where they maybe have similar habits over quite a large geographical area. But many populations are single populations are conservation unit. So for coho salmon, chum salmon, pink salmon, generally the, the conservation units are made up of tens or even hundreds of populations. So relatively large conservation areas. So for instance, the lower Fraser area, I believe they have two conservation uh, groupings of chum salmon. And then the chum salmon of the coastal areas north of Howe Sound are in a separate, separate conservation area, but still quite large. Same with pink salmon and actually same with coho salmon. And what that suggests is these populations do share genes and movement of fish between watersheds and those fish when they move actually survive and do okay. So many of the stories of coho and chum salmon in the urban areas, for example, uh, so I'll use chum salmon specifically, the Metro Vancouver streams effectively lost their chum salmon very early in the 20th century. They were just too visible, too many people uh, doing bad things to them, physically bad things. Dogs, people see large fish in small streams. It doesn't usually end well in, in the past. Now, it's changed. We love our salmon. So in fact, large fish in small streams are a thing of celebration. So over the last 30 years, many of the small streams of Metro Vancouver have been repopulated with chum salmon from the same conservation unit, often using conservation hatcheries in places like Kanaka Creek, the Metro Vancouver uh, supported uh, conservation hatchery in, um, in Kanaka Creek Regional Park and on the Alouette River, supported by the Ministry of Corrections of both salmon enhancement program supported hatcheries. But those little uh, mother hatcheries have provided eggs to repopulate chum salmon throughout the Metro Vancouver area, including Burnaby uh, Brunette River chum salmon. Came originally from Alouette River and Kanaka Creek in the same conservation unit. So uh, coho chums large, but the 
sockeye are even more like Chinook. Typically, a conservation unit for sockeye is just the fish that live in that lake, if they're lake rearing type, which is the most common type of sockeye. So the Harrison Lake has a conservation unit. Alouette sockeye, uh, Pitt River sockeye, Cultus Lake sockeye are all conservation units. And I'll talk a little bit more about Cultus Lake Sockeye in that when you are a conservation unit, the Canadian government has drawn a line that we will not lose a conservation unit on our watch. So they will take actions to keep a conservation unit around. And it can be a real challenge. Cultus Lake Sockeye, if most many people know, is I think the most endangered sockeye population in BC. A lot of people are trying a lot of things to keep it around. It's a really challenging environment. Human impacts from the past are weighing heavily on this population. So we'll talk a little bit about, about that population uh, toward the end of this. So generally, why are sockeye salmon in this group? Waters from the earth. We'll find out. The reason that sockeye salmon are included in this waters from the earth team is that they are commonly found spawning on groundwater upwelling areas, generally within their rearing lakes throughout BC. So the problem is, problem from a habitat restoration uh, point of view, is much of this spawning occurs deep under the lake surface, 50 meters or more sometimes. And it's where these springs, groundwater springs, enter the lake. They're often at the base of these large alluvial outwash delta from these really steep mountain tributary streams, coarse material. A lot of the water, this is similar to the Hicks Creek example, actually, a lot of the water goes into the stream bed high up on the mountain, creates an aquifer, and discharges at the base of these uh, deltas and often where they discharge is at depth. So the reality is there's not a lot of options we have to assist or expand the spawning grounds in these sorts of situations. Now, if you want to re read a little bit more about it, maybe you don't believe me, have a look at this paper. It's a great one on a local lake, the Alouette Lake of Stashtamuk, one of ours, and it's just a great story to give you an idea, the, the adaptability of these species, really interesting. So sometimes the sockeye salmon that are targeting groundwater upwelling areas are found closer to the surface. surface. It's often just the geology, how that water moves through aquifers and where it actually discharges. Sometimes it can be slightly above the surface. In, a, in, in an example I'll actually talk about, or just below the surface on the beach. And I'm gonna give two examples where we have tried some salmon habitat restoration with some success. So the first example was, in, was at Calum Lake in the Skeener, Skeener River watershed. Now this is a long way from here, but it's still a really interesting example. And it may have applications in lakes nearer to home in the future. So this poor sockeye run in the 1980s was down to under a thousand spawners, probably because of the combined effect of overfishing in the Skeena River fisheries, targeting the really abundant Babine River sockeye runs and extensive logging of that watershed over the previous years. And it's a bit like our pink story in Georgia Strait. If you know a little bit about the Skeena, we have tremendously abundant runs in one watershed, the Babine River run for sockeye. And then all the other little populations of sockeye in the Skeener are mixed in and they're not as productive. So when they fish, the Babine fish hard, these other little runs slowly decline and some of them became very, very endangered. So in the 1980s, there was a concern about the Calum Lake sockeye. So during a review of the watershed, looking at habitat restoration opportunities for population, salmon populations at risk, a few sockeye were observed spawning at the base 
of a glacially deposit gravel hill at the edge of Calum Lake. So you can imagine this is a glacial modified landscape and a high gravel bank reaching high in the sky, all deposited by the glaciers. But that gravel was very porous when it rained and the snow melt and the creeks uh, flowed over this deposit. Much of the water went into the ground and it and it upwelled or discharged at the base of the hill at the edge of Caleb Lake. Now, interestingly enough, these sorts of locations were often identified, this one in particular, by local individuals that were simply being asked by the professionals, do you know where sockeye spawn? And do you know of any places that sockeye are spawning in unusual places suggesting groundwater? gentleman named Mike Welpley from Terrace, Salmon Advocate, took us to this site for the very first time. So the question on the site was, could we develop a groundwater spawning channel just like the one recently constructed on the Mamquam River for chum salmon that we have previously discussed? And would these sockeye use it and do well? That was the question. That was the challenge. This is what was done. So it's always a little bit fun and exciting to try new things when you really don't know what you're doing. And this is the definition of this Calum Lake groundwater fed channel. So in 1984, a channel was built along the toe of this large gravel bank at the base of a road. There was a road just up uphill from us. So not a very pretty site. And we're at the edge of Calum Lake, but where a large glacial river feeds the top end of the lake. And the, in, during the summer and even into the fall, high sediment loads in the lake and this river. But the groundwater is very clear. So it was built along the toe and a berm was built beside the channel that could find the clear groundwater on one side and the silty water on the other. Uh, perfect spawning gravel was placed along the length of the channel. So what happened? Interestingly enough, from the handfuls of sake first observed over the next decade, those numbers slowly increased to the point that now 37 years since this experimental channel was placed, it still produces sake. It can be hundreds of fish in some years. It can be thousands of fish in some years. So again, an experimental project continues to play a part in making Calum Lake Sake more resilient in the face of a broad range of pressures on this unique salmon run. So again, the message is in this business, it's complicated. We really don't fully understand what our actions will mean. So we have to make an educated guess, do what we can to gather the information, try something, assess it, and if it works, see if we can reapply it in another situation. Now, interestingly enough, we haven't found another site in British Columbia to do this, but maybe that's a challenge for the next restoration team to think about where there's a little sockeye run that's challenged, that's spawning on groundwater that might be appropriate for this type of groundwater channel. However, I'm going to talk about another potential site that uses groundwater and a technology that we've already discussed at Hicks Creek that perhaps help these two relatively challenged, rare and endangered sockeye population. So a point of clarification, I indicated that the Calum Lake channel was the only channel constructed for sockeye salmon in British Columbia. There, in fact, was a second channel called the Cottonwood Channel at the mouth of the Adams River near Shushwap Lake in the interior of British Columbia. It's actually referred to in the Fish Habitat Rehabilitation Procedures Toolbox um, in Section 7-3. It's a good discussion of use of groundwater areas, and it mentions this particular channel. Uh, it was well used by sockeye salmon, but it was particularly uh, of use and of interest when it was built for whether it 
assisted interior BC interior coho salmon, which were in crisis during the period of its construction. That was 1992. Now it functioned quite well. It had issues with uh, beaver dams forming in the channel and they required annual maintenance. And because it was at the lower end of the Adams River Delta, just before Shuswap Lake, the river is unconstrained in this place. And over a series of decades, the river finally reclaimed the channel. Anyway, there's an interesting report that I'm putting a link to that just talked about use of these groundwater channels in the BC interior by in BC interior coho salmon. And it refers to the sockeye use of the Cottonwood Channel. An interesting read. So the second example I'd like to talk about is actually a project that has not been built. It may never be built, but at least it might be considered in the future. And this is part of a normal conversation on how projects develop. They start with an idea, a discussion, a research, and then a decision. Should we proceed? What are the risks? What are the benefits? So as I described with the Hicks Creek example, often groundwater flows down under the alluvial delta of a steep creek as it comes down for the mountains above and up wells along the base of that alluvial deposit. In this case, I will re be referring to a site that occurs on Cultus Lake, where a steep mountain stream has created a large alluvial delta that pushes out into Cultus Lake, and this delta is now the Cultus Lake Provincial Park. So if you walk along the beaches of the southern portion of this delta in perhaps early December, if you are lucky, you will see sockeye salmon spawning here and there along the beach, presumably and almost certainly seeking out these small groundwater seeps and inflows. So because the nature of this alluvial deposit, many places that the groundwater flows into the lake will be sandy and other fine materials and not suitable for use by sockeye salmon spawning. And here lies the habitat restoration opportunity. If some of these groundwater flows that were not contributing to successful spawning areas could be collected through a drainage gallery similar to one I described for the Hicks Creek project and put into a Hicks Creek type upwelling spawning pond at the edge of the lake, would sockeye salmon use it and do well? Well, that story has not been written yet. But considering the Cultus Lake sockeye salmon are one of the most endangered sockeye populations in BC, someone might just give it a try. We will have to wait and see. So I'd like to talk about another example of sockeye salmon that's spawning groundwater here in the lower mainland. And it's the Widgeon River type sockeye salmon and the Kosewick has designated them as threatened. So this population uh, spawns, but their juveniles when they emerge do not rear in a lake. They come out of the spawning beds, move down to the nearby Pitt River has a lot of marshes and sloughs along the lower Pitt River. They rear there for a while, they move slowly into the lower Fraser, go up various tidal channels, and their habitats that they use, they often are found 
existing with those Harrison River Chinook fry, almost identical habitat needs. And just like the Harrison River Chinook fry, they start to move toward the ocean in early summer, and probably by midsummer, they're now heading out into the Strait of Georgia. So very unusual for sockeye. Most sockeye populations uh, live in lakes, and this is somewhat similar to the populations we discussed up in the Squamish River type or riverine sockeye salmon. Uh, now where they actually spawn is very similar to the example I gave for Hicks Creek coho. You have a large talus or slide type deposit goes way up a hillside and then it falls down onto the floodplain of the lower pit river and it just at the base there's small patches of smaller gravels that the fish have managed to dig up and they've created their own spawning ground that has this upwelling groundwater flowing out of this rock slide very interesting if you want to learn to learn more about the scientific status of this population you know that word kosiwik report I put a link in here, you should read it. It's very interesting and it will talk about Cultus Lake and the Widgeon River type sockeye salmon. So looking at the little picture to the right, you can see the little blue arrows and there's angular rock. This is the base of that angular rock talus slide type material and the water is percolating through it. And then just where that red circle is, there's a little bit of finer material. It looks cleaner. It's been turned over. That's actually where fish have been digging, right at the base of this talus slope and trying to deposit their eggs in this rather poor quality, but still upwelling groundwater zone. This is where the Widgeon river type sockeye spawn. So this is a picture of the Widgeon Creek sockeye spawning habitat. Now notice that these fish must move through dense stands of reed canary grass in a tidal marsh habitat to access these upwelling groundwater habitats that lie, that lie tight against the nearby rocky talus slope. In some places, they have cleared significant patches of usable spawning gravel. So notice the angular pieces of gravel that forms the spawning beds and a relatively high proportion of fine sediments. Again, upwelling groundwater actually can compensate for relatively poor spawning material because there's an aquifer uh, hydrostatic pressure that for forces oxygenated water from below through these finer materials. In a natural stream, finer material materials limit the flow of oxygenated water from the surface stream into the gravel to the eggs, but it's the exact opposite direction of flow with groundwater. So finer and poorer materials actually can function reasonably well in an gra upwelling groundwater environment. The other point to notice is just the shallow depth of the spawning area. Obviously adult salmon cannot spawn here at this time. But as I mentioned, this is an area under the tidal influence coming from the lower pit and lower Fraser River. There's probably possibly up to a meter or half a meter of tide in this reach. It is during those high tide periods that these fish, these little sockeye salmon, have to get in and lay their eggs and get out before the tide drops. So this is a picture of a post-spawning widgeon sockeye salmon. A couple things to note. It has those subdued colors typical of this population, not the bright reds, the brilliant reds of many sockeye populations. It's more a mottled red, olives and greens. And it's a very small body size. So being small, and in this case, better camouflaged, is likely a very good thing when you are trying to evade the bears, coyotes, raccoons, and in this case, some wolves that visit every night as these sockeye try to spawn in these particularly shallow and vulnerable locations. So again, population, time, and place specific considerations. So these guys are obviously survivors, but they remain vulnerable and threatened as, as identified by Kosowick, due to, due to this limited spawning habitat and their population size.
it is unlikely their spawning habitat will naturally increase. There's a possibility it will decrease over time. This is, this is the consideration. So the question, should we or could we assist them through a directed salmon habitat restoration? This, in fact, is a question we have been pondering for more than a decade. They are so fragile, but still stable, should we even risk trying? So like the Cultus Lake sockeye discussion, there appears to be sites to place upwelling spawning ponds similar in design in the design that was used successfully for many years for coho and in fact chum salmon at Hicks Creek. Now I showed pictures where water is coming out of coarse talus and fish were spawning right adjacent, but there's other sites farther along the talus slope that either because of insufficient gravel or too deep a reed canary grass are not being used by sockeye salmon at this present time, but still have groundwater outflows. Those provide an opportunity to collect those outflows and create new spawning grams, grounds of the design I show here that would expand the amount of spawnable habitat for this population and the goal would be to increase its population size and make it more resilient to future uh, declines due to climate events, possibly fishing events. That's the idea. However, any disturbance of this very restricted area could bring unintended consequence, so no, has, no actions has been taken to date. We would have to make sure that whatever waters we, were, we collected for the new habitats, in fact, were not feeding existing habitats. That would take some, some science and some monitoring. The second, the second concern that, as a biologist, came to mind is this site does not have a coexisting population. It appears does not have a coexisting population of chum salmon, and yet the habitat appears suitable. There may be something about the extreme shallowness and the tidal nature of this site and the small body size of the sockeye that effectively denies chum salmon access to the site due to their larger body size and the fact that they are a larger population that has evolved to take advantage of many other habitats in the area where these sockeye have specialized. This is their one patch in the world that they exist. So one of the issues, the unintended consequence, if you improved habitat for sockeye salmon, you, you might be careful as a designer to make that habitat relatively shallow and still operate by tidal function. Because if you made it too fish friendly, the question would be, would chum salmon ultimately at some point find the habitat, find the deeper water attractive and compete with the sockeye for spawning grounds. Bigger fish generally win. So these are the questions you, every project you undertake should ask. And if that is a concern, the design should take that into consideration and have options both in the first design to address it and possibly options to modify the design in the future if it truly was a real, con real concern, not an assumed concern. So this is, this is a good way to, to end this discussion, I think. And it starts back to what we talked about in the beginning of this uh, conversation. Remember, really important, think once, think again, and think again. And then if you are confident of success, take action. And only time will tell you if you did the right thing. So for the Widgeon Sockeye, the thinking part continues as it should. We still have some time to get our decision right. I just want to summarize some of the ideas and concepts that we presented in lesson three about groundwater fed spawning areas. Now the first one that I think I think is important to state is groundwater fed spawning areas, while they are common, 
they are in unique uh, areas of watersheds. They're not everywhere. So often the easiest way to identify groundwater habitats that may have use to salmon is actually to track the salmon themselves. Find the latest spawning populations and have a real good look at those areas. At the geology, go out the middle of the winter in the coldest days and look for open water. I know when we were looking for groundwater habitats in the far north, often it was done through flying up valleys looking for open water in the depths of winter. And then later we went back and did the research when those areas were accessible. Again, groundwater, when it's, when it's available, is really valuable habitat to these species of salmon mentioned. Coho salmon, certain forms of sockeye salmon, and chum salmon. But while common, it is usually located in very discrete areas of the watershed. So this is the detective part of the story. But once those areas are found, often multiple projects can be designed in reaches of river. Here in Stashkamut, uh, the lower end of the Mamquam River, the middle reach of the, the lower middle reach of the Chequemus River, uh, the various sloughs of the Harrison River, uh, various side channels of Norrish Creek, the Vedder River on the Chilliwack, are all areas where multiple groundwater habitats have been constructed over the decades because these areas are groundwater rich and they support quite important populations of salmon. So that's one of the messages. When the sites have been identified, it does take monitoring and I would say deep engineering experience to build a successful groundwater project. These are not simple projects. So you need a really tight team of professionals to help with that. Now, you may be a professional yourself, but like if you're a steward, you simply can be those eyes and track down these locations. This is invaluable part of that team, finding these locations that perhaps can be uh, expanded using the example on Widgeon, Widgeon Slough sockeye or even the, some of the beach spawning areas along Cultus Lake. All of that really requires boots on the ground, people observing and looking for things that they think might be there but they have to find them. So again no matter your skill sets that part is the very critical first step and actually anyone with a little bit of knowledge and a good observation skills can deliver good sites for groundwater channels. So finally, I want to leave you with a story that touches on this groundwater, this idea of groundwater across the Pacific Rim. These areas have been known for millennia by people, local people in the area as very unique sites where the latest salmon runs of the year came. And if you think about it, when salmon were the critical uh, last uh, ability to get food before the northern winter set in, these late runs were like gold and they were magical places. So I hope you read the story about uh, chum salmon around the Pacific Rim in a few of these wonderful places. And think about, can we make more of these habitats in our area, Scouch to Mook, to support our late run timing sockeye salmon, chum salmon, and coho salmon. Good luck.